uh, his son made the announcement, so we're good. Um, okay. Hello and welcome to Cross's Corner. It's been a little bit of a break, but I'm delighted to have Jason Dorland with me now. Hi, Jason. Hello, Martin. So uh, for those of you that uh, might not know Jason Dorland particularly well, some of you will have read his books, uh, Chariots and Horses, and your second book is called... Pulling Together. Yeah, Pulling Together, which is a, a, a coaching journal. We'll kind of get into that. Um, but Jason is a Canadian Olympian, uh, three times on the Canadian team in the Seoul Olympics in 88. He's an entrepreneur, a teacher, a rowing coach, an art student. I mean, <laughs> it's it's amazing the kind of things you've got on your resume, Jason. Well, I'm a curious guy. I've always described myself as curious, and uh, and I just love to dabble. So um, I, it's just the way I'm wired, I guess. Yeah. So just before we get started, a big thanks to Ludum, who uh, sponsor these programs. Ludum is the performance development software for coaches and sports teams. And it's really great if you're in a squad, you can get the readout of all your performance. It's a fantastic system. And you can get a 30-day free trial by visiting ludum.com and signing up. So, uh, Jason, I know we, we were talking before we went on air and, and you described that piece of boat behind you. Yes. So maybe you could just do that for sure. the viewers and listeners. Amazing. Yeah, it's a beauty. And uh, so that beautiful piece of German engineering is uh, three seat from um, a Carlish eight. And it was the eight that uh, Neil Campbell, who was my high school coach and my national team coach, um, loaned to the, to the New Zealanders in the 76 Olympics in Montreal. And they won uh, a bronze medal in that boat. And then... Um, and as a sort of acknowledgement of Neil, they taped literally Neil Campbell on the bow yeah. of that boat for further racing and um, as, a, as a thank you. And uh, the boat became called the, became uh, the Neil Campbell. And so Neil brought that back to Ridley, back to St. Catharines where he was coaching. And, um, and I was fortunate enough to sit in that boat for three years, grade 11, 12 and 13. Uh, and that was, you know, my brother picked this, uh, thing up at a, at an auction and I couldn't believe when I, when I picked it up from him and, and sort of looked under and it was three seat. It was the seat that I sat in. And so I've got it here because I've got all these things on the wall. All these, these are my sort of teachers and I've got a picture of Robin and a crew that I coached at Sean again and my, and my 1983 crew at Ridley and, um, in that seat. And, uh. So, as I've said many times, I learned more in high school sitting in that seat than I did in any other seat, and uh, it was a great, uh, it was a great teacher. That's that's really interesting because um, how much? I mean, what did you learn in 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 that in that high school? Because there's so much of a dramatic turnaround in your in your life and career that you you talk about in chariots and horses after yeah. the, after the Seoul Olympics. What what I you know what I distinct what I find distinctive between my high school rowing and my national team rowing was that uh, in high school, especially grade eleven, that first year with Neil, is I I still loved the sport, right? I still loved rowing, and um, you know when Neil Campbell's your high school coach, you know, like <laughs> it's uh, it's quite a world, right? And um, so uh, he just he was able to elicit uh, an effort, and uh, you know, for me, I was able to discover things that I just never thought I would have been capable of uh, on a physiological level, right? And uh, and to be able to push to levels of exhaustion that I just didn't think were capable, and yeah. and I learned that in that in that seat, and. Um, so uh, I'm forever grateful. Uh, it's a you know 70 strokers and 2,000 meter pieces and what have you. And I, I just think you learn things about yourself you don't necessarily learn in a math class. And that's not to say that you know high school and academics aren't 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 important. But as a person, I learned more about myself 
through the sport of rowing than, than I certainly did any other, any other way. Yeah. And it might be good just to uh, tell the listeners a little bit about Neil Campbell. I mean, he's quite similar in a way to Tony O'Connor who coached the New Zealand eight to gold in uh, Tokyo being a school teacher. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Neil was, um, you know, a member of the Canadian eight or in, in, in Mexico in 68. And then I think the Canadian men's four in 64 in, um, Tokyo. Tokyo. Thank you. And, um, uh, and he stroked the Canadian eight in 68 at the age of 38. And, wow. uh, and it wasn't because they couldn't find anybody. <laughs> you know, he was, he was just that tenacious and, um, and he brought that level of tenacity to his coaching. Um, he was certainly a legend in Canada, I, I would, I would say, and, um, just had a reputation for, um, you know, for creating some very fast crews that, you know, came over to England and had a lot of success at Henley and uh, yeah. in the Princess Elizabeth. So, but, you know, just a remarkable man. I mean, you know, a bit of a John Wayne character for sure. Um, very old school. Um, and uh, yeah. When I mean, you when you say old school, just explain a little bit about what that means. Yeah. So in terms of coaching, it was very much a stick and carrot approach to motivation. So, you know, I, 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 with Neil, it wasn't that I loved winning. It was that I loved not losing. It was, it was about not losing. And, and it's not like Neil ever yelled at us or anything like that, but there, there was a, um, yeah, there was a palpable difference when when we lost, and we lost in grade twelve. I'll never forget that, right? Uh, at the Canadian High School Championships, and that was our qualifying race to go over to England and race at the PE. And ah, uh. and uh, wow, that was uh, was a moment, right? And um, so uh, I just think Neil had an intensity about him that y you didn't y you you wanted to make sure that the results of a race were, were correct. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, and I learned it as a young boy that winning was right and losing was wrong. Yeah. So, yeah. so how, what was your trajectory from uh, leaving Ridley to the national team? Yeah. So I um, accepted a scholarship to Syracuse university and I went down there for two years, uh, rode in the freshman crew, which was, uh, fantastic experience. Rode with some of the top high school rowers in North America, and um, with a young coach called Larry Laszlo. And uh, you know, it was a great experience. We came second at the IRAs. Um, wow! And uh, and then um, had knee surgery that following year, and um, and then after a year of recovery, was invited to come out west. To Victoria and train with the national team, go to University of uh, Victoria and train under Al Moro and uh, with yeah, uh, I know Al right uh, with some of the top Canadian rowers and and um, yeah, so that was just an amazing experience. And then '86 Commonwealth Games and uh, the Worlds in Nottingham, and then uh, Copenhagen, and then uh, and then Seoul. What do you remember about the Commonwealth Games in '86? Because I I was there right. too. It uh, was the wind. wind. <laughs> the wind, yeah. yeah. The eights took so long to get off yeah. the start, didn't they? Yeah. It was. I mean, it was. Uh, it was one of those races where, um, you know, one of those strange races where you just you couldn't put it all on the end of the oar because it was, you, yeah. you know, it was the odd stroke when you wouldn't even get a blade of water. And, um, it was, the water was so tippy and the waves were crashing over the side. And anyway, it was just one of those races, but, uh, I think we came fourth. It was a, to I think the Kiwis were third. Yeah. Brits were second and, uh, Aussies were first. And, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, it was my first international event really. And, um, but Nottingham was, uh, after that was sort of an eye opener for me in terms of the level of competition. It was my first time seeing the Abagnales and Stephen Redgrave and, yeah, you know, all yeah. these guys that I knew as a young boy. And I, and I was still a young kid really. Um, 
what I would have been 21 ish. And, uh, so it was an eye popping experience to watch that for j just to be there and see, and see these, these men and, and see the size of some of the, um, some of those crews. And then yeah. at Lucerne as well, that was, you know, sort of a, uh, sort of a, um, a realization of going from high school to university level and then international world level. That was, talk, to, uh, talk to me about the first time you saw the Rotse and, uh, and raced yeah. on it. Well, I th you know, what I always remember, interestingly enough, are the cows and the bell <laughs> on the hills beside the course. And um, I remember in, uh, um, uh, I guess, 88, our, it was our first race together in Lucerne and um, pouring rain bef just before the race and then got out and it was dead calm. And... It was the same six boats that ended up being in the final in Seoul. And, you know, I think we'd been together maybe three weeks. Yeah. And uh, we were leading at the thousand and we had a tremendous amount of speed in that crew. And, um, you know, it was the fastest boat I'd ever been in. And I was, again, just in awe of of to be rowing with my Olympic heroes as a boy, you know, with... Uh, some of the guys still on the crew and from left over from 84. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, we went on to finish fourth in that race. Um, we, you know, we just needed a little more time to finish out that finish up or to figure out that bottom thousand. But yeah. Anyway, so, beautiful place to row. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in in terms of uh, Canada being Olympic champions, I mean, how much was that a rod for your back backs in terms of? Well, it was for me. You know, if I, you know, now when I look back, uh, as much as waking up that morning was was exciting about the prospects of winning an Olympic gold medal and defending that championship, you know, sitting in those gates, um, if if I'm honest about my experience of that. I would say now that the fear of of not winning w was more was more present. Like, what would happen if if we lost? And um, which you know was certainly a pattern from high school, right? It was the fear of letting down Neil, and uh, and so that was alive in me for sure. And then when the you know when the Germans um, had the boat prop boat uh, equipment trouble and and we were told the race would be delayed, what, 15 minutes. And we came back and, and it was just a different vibe in the boat, right? Uh, after that um, race delay. So yeah, anyway, it was a, yeah, it was a crazy time. I'm interested about, about that because I, you know, I had my own issues in terms of the Olympics in 84 um, in the, I, I'd won a bronze medal in the Moscow games, right. which I was really comfortable with and really overjoyed with, but I never really saw myself as good enough to be an Olympic champion. So right. in, in that race, my, that final race, my motivation was not to lose it. Right. Um, and, and we were losing it for most of the race because we were down on the Americans. Right. So I had a very strong away from motivation, um, and and I I don't think it did me any good really because I ended up with this uh, medal that I kind of felt, you know, I'm not sure I really deserve this because I never saw myself as Olympic champion. Mm -hmm. So I kind of created a two tier system of right. um, these are people that really deserve to win Olympic gold medals. And these are people that just happen to have one. Right. <laughs> Which really screwed me up for many years. And, you know, I think lots of therapy and, and that kind of stuff right. uh, help with it. But um, I, I know in your book, you write a lot about, you know, the race and, uh, and, and how that race went. I mean, was it just as simple as the switch just flicked it off in those 15 minutes well you know i think um rowing away from those gates it was the first time in all of our rowing careers including the other crews where 
you had arrived to a starting to the gates, backed your boat in, you were at the height of your readiness, both physically and emotionally. And then you were told to come back in 15 minutes. So you, so you left the gates in a paddle. Yeah. And you, you've never done that before. And, um, and so the, then coming back 15 minutes later, and not that this is an excuse because it happened to all six crews, but um, there was a flatness, a heaviness to the boat. And in fact, you know, I remember our Coxie Brian, um, there was, we wanted to fall start, right? Just to, to fire it up again, because there was such a flatness to, to the feeling of being in that, in that, in those gates a second time. But um, that got sort of, that got quashed and, yeah. uh, and we came out of there and, and that was that, you know, I, I mean, goodness, who knows what would have happened if we'd all raced uh, on the first time, but I'm not saying we would have won, but I, I think it might've been different. So yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, goodness, those Germans were impressive and, uh, you know, um, in all likelihood would have won that race. Yeah. That's Ralph Holtmeyer. Ralph Holtmeyer's crew. That was probably, um, I think that was his, his first of many gold medals. Yeah. Um, I think he coached again the Olympic gold in 2012. Hmm. His crew won. But okay. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I know on the front of your book, you have that photograph from the newspaper. Right. Um, which is, it, it's, it's extremely interesting how you use that in the book and, and, and what, that, what that said about you. Can you tell us a little bit of the story around that? Sure. Well, you know, that photograph was a moment, right? Um, you know, we had stayed in Seoul for the week after the final and, and sort of, and, and kind of broke apart as a unit and went off and just did our own thing. Um, you know, back in the, in those days, scotch was the, was the therapy, right? And, um, there was no debrief. There was no, you know, how are you doing? There was no nothing. Right. And, and I, and I wasn't, uh, really a drinker. So that's, you know, I, <laughs> I just had my own ways to deal with it. And, and, um, and so I think, you know, in that first week, it was more anger, it was more frustration, it was more disbelief, it was, those were the sort of my emotions anyway. And, um, but then got, getting home that first night after hours of travel, and coming home to my parents, who didn't, didn't really know what to say. Yeah. Um, and it was late. And my dad said, you know, there's a box full of newspaper clippings in the living room, if you want to have a look and uh and i was my clock was so screwed up and so i sat down and flipped through those newspaper clippings and there was the front page of the globe and mail right the sports section canada's national newspaper and, th and there was that photo right it was us slumped over our wars at the finish line and the headline canadians bomb out in seoul and then an article that laid blame and you know i was what 24 25 at the time and it's the first time I've ever read my name in, in the Globe and Mail and the first time I'd ever uh, <laughs> had somebody say such disparaging things about our yeah. and and um, you know I know I, I didn't know at the time but I can know now it was the first it was it I had a panic attack right just this rush of adrenaline my heart felt like it was going to come through my chest because I began to digest this notion of wow this wasn't you know, we didn't just lose the race for us. We lost this race for the country. And the magnitude of that hit home like a truck. And um, uh, yeah, there were some bumpy times starting in that day. And uh, so I took a year off and then traveled down to Australia. I just figured I needed to get away and be where some, you know, where nobody knew me. And then when I came back and began training in the fall of uh, 89, um, I used that photograph every morning and every afternoon and evening for before practice, right? And uh, I would just look at that photograph and remember the the rage and, and the shame. 
and uh, and just go to that place and remember the sound of the Germans yelling and celebrating. Yeah, yeah. And um, and just thinking that is never going to happen again, and I'm going to fix this. And um, and wow, did it ever work? Like it just, I was on fire for about six months, right? Just uh, tenacious with my training. Um, strength was came back in a number of months, lifting more than I ever had in my career. Wow. My scores were fantastic. So it was all going swimmingly, and then and then it crashed. Right? Uh, I just think the anger and uh, revisiting that place every single day, a couple times a day, just started to spill over. Right? And um, and I was just becoming a very angry and bitter young man. And so um, when one morning, when getting hit by a car seemed like a reasonable excuse to to miss the practice that day, <clears throat> I, I knew that I was in trouble. So. Yeah. yeah. Was you had was that when Mike Spracklin was coaching? Mike had just taken over. Yeah. How did you find working with Mike Spracklin in, in that well, state um, of mind? You know, I tell the story in the book. I didn't have a great introduction with Mike. <sighs> um, uh, you know, I remember being in the single and him pulling up the side, asking how things were going, and I and I yelled at him, and uh, <laughs> and not because Mike had done anything, but just because the boat, the rig was was wrong i couldn't move my foot stretchers and you know i was just such a loose cannon and you know and he just came over and sort of just, just take it easy just take it into the dock and we'll get it fixed for the for the second row and you know when i think back now what a jackass but uh it was you know it's who i was and it's where i was at the time uh but um, and then I retired uh, a few months after that. So I never got really a chance to be coached by Mike because um, I was training up at Shawnigan on my own and then coming down for camps. And um, But I, it wasn't until I started coaching at Shawnigan that I, be, that I really got to know Mike in his, uh, in his second bid in the early 2000s, where I would go out in the coach boat with him if I had a spare at Sean, yeah. the men would train there on the lake and I would drive the coach boat for him while he could, so he could video and, and I would just listen and watch and, and uh, yeah, it was great. What did you learn? Uh, what sort of things did you learn from that Mike? Um, yeah. Uh, well, you know, and, and with all respect uh, to Mike, you know, part of the things that we learn when, whenever we're working with someone, and I would say the same for Neil too, part of, you know, we sort of take the pieces that work for us, right? Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. And we leave alone the pieces that don't. And so as much as I love Neil and as much as Neil taught me so much, there's a lot about who Neil was and how he coached that I would never bring into my toolkit, right? And, and the same thing with Mike. Uh, I was, um, he was a, you know, he was such a stickler for for blade work and timing and, and um and working as a unit and contributing to the boat speed and all those sorts of things, which were so important. And, yeah. and I saw the effects of that, but I also witnessed him pit athletes against one another on his yeah. own. Yeah. And, and I just saw, you know, I saw um, explosive behavior on the water between athletes in different boats. And Mike seemed to think that was healthy. And um yeah, I didn't. So, you know, fair enough. I mean, he he got results, but uh, I just felt like that wasn't the coach that I wanted to be. Those weren't the tactics that I was willing to to uh, take on. Yeah, that's really interesting. By then, you you had clarity in terms of how you wanted to work. I, I kind of uh, I, I'm interested in terms of just the description of of how you decided to walk away from rowing. Well, yeah. I think um, I just uh, using that stick and carrot, and use, it was mainly a stick at this point. It was a whipping stick, and, and it was the loss and soul. That was the only thing that got me out to practice every day, right, was, was redemption, revenge, retribution. Yeah. Th those were, that was the fuel. And, uh, and as I've said, you know, 
powerful fuel, intense fuel, but it's a, it's a, it's a, got a short lifespan. And um, because it becomes emotionally exhausting, I just couldn't yeah. keep that pace. And I couldn't keep up with that constant, um, you know, if you don't go out today, you know, the Germans are, tra are training today, Jace, what are you, a wimp? Like, what's your yeah, problem? Yeah, right? yeah. And uh, so that constant belittling. Um, so it wasn't the excitement of wanting to get out and train. It was simply surviving another session. And, and I just thought, I can't do this for three years. And uh, yeah, I was just at a point where I was just so angry at, at everything. And, um, and so I just knew that, you know, I just, uh, for self-preservation, I had to walk away. Yeah. Which, which was, you know, a bit of a kicker, right? I was, uh, you know, 25 ish, 26. And, and I had grown a, another half inch since Seoul. I had gained 15 pounds and, and I knew that I hadn't, achieve my physical yeah. abilities, right? I, I knew that I hadn't reached my potential. And so if there's any regret, that's the regret, is that I never saw my potential as an athlete. But, you know, but I trust I trust it all worked out the way it was supposed to. And and, uh, and there's no regret around my my retirement piece. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I, you know, one of the thoughts that crossed my mind is, I, I suppose systems weren't like that then where you had somebody to talk to. I didn't have anyone to talk to at the time. I was training on my own. Uh, Andrea Schreiner, who was a you know national team athlete as well. Yeah, I remember her. Right, and um, she was coaching me because she was coaching at the at the school as well. So she would take me out sometimes in the coach boat and and romp and down beside me and offer some pointers. And but I was following Mike's program, but on my own and. Um, yeah, it wasn't a healthy environment. Yeah. There was no outlet, right? There was no one. You know, for one thing, Martin, I, th I thought I was the first one to ever go through this. So not only did I think I was broken because I had lost in soul and there was something wrong with me, I also thought there was something wrong with me because I was having so much trouble. And so I wasn't about a to tell anyone that, right? A double whammy. Yeah, so there's no way I was going to admit both. So... so and and taking what did taking a, a break from rowing or, or or walking away from it what did that do to you did that lessen the pressure did or was there still more that you had to go through before that unwound yeah i think that was just the beginning right that was <laughs> that was where um that was just the beginning of the transition and you know now we have a name for it right athlete transition there was no yeah. name back then right? yeah we didn't it, there was no textbook. There was no uh, sports psych to, who intervened. It was figure this out on your own. And, um, you know, I know now that all of my, all of the things that I went through were, were, were textbook, uh, you know, sort of loss of identity, loss of purpose. Yeah. Uh, there was anxiety, depression. I developed a OCD workout regimen. I struggled with an eating disorder. I got down to 170 pounds and wow. I was, uh, I was not well, I was not in a good place. And, um, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it was a rough ride, but, um, I did find my way out of it and I did sort it out and, and I'm grateful for those years. Yeah. As hard as they were, uh, because I figured a lot of stuff out. Right. I, I think I, you know, when I got into coaching, I came back as a better coach because of because of what I had been through as a, as a, as not just as an athlete, but as a yeah, human yeah, being, yeah. Right? I'd like to talk about that uh, yeah. just just before. Um, it, it's very striking your relationship with Robin, your wife, and yeah. how how that started, and the way that her ideas seemed, you know, like the polar opposite of yours. And, and I guess gradually how you came to accept, you know, her worldview about competing. Right. Well, uh, you know, we met at the Commonwealth Games here in Victoria, 94. And uh, I came to watch her race in the final of the Women's 3000. Uh, so she was an Olympian, national team member for a long time. 
And, um, but we met on a date before that final and um, about a week or so before. And, you know, I remember asking her how she was going to do. And she said she was just going to go out and do her best. And, and I was just so taken aback because every track athlete that I had ever met was, was a pretty confident athlete. In fact, I would say cocky, right. Yeah. And uh, full of swagger and, <laughs> and all that kind of self, you know, like a peacock almost. And, and that was not Robin. She was very humble, very quiet. Um, I mean, you wouldn't know if she was a, ro a runner uh, unless you saw her legs. I mean, she yeah. was incredibly fit and muscular and, um, but her behavior, her persona was not, you know, world-class runner. And, um, but what she went on to explain to me was that, you know, she'd had trouble with her immune system through the winter and spring. And so she wasn't feeling ready or prepared. And, and so she and her coach decided it was just to go out there and see what she's got and do you know, do your best, which I found out later was just her. I mean, that was her strategy every time anyway. So, uh, um, so I was a bit, I was shocked and I didn't say anything. I mean, I wasn't an idiot. I want this woman yeah. beautiful. And I thought, <laughs> keep your mouth shut, Jace. Like you want to date her again. So don't, don't say that this is a stupid idea. And <laughs> so, you know, I showed up in, at the race and sure enough, opening laps, she was tied for last. And, uh, and then halfway through the 3000 lap five, she started to move. And she went from last to silver medal behind Angela Chalmers, right? Canada's so gold and silver for Canada. And, yeah. and, and I was just, um, I, I still consider it one of the most inspiring races I've ever seen. Right? It was oh, a wow. life changing moment for me because, because I knew the context of the race for Robin. I knew she was ill prepared. I knew that her approach was weak or soft or wrong in my view. And, and yet she still came out of there with a silver yeah. medal when she, when she in all likelihood shouldn't have. Right. Yeah. 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 Top Kenyans, top Kiwis and Brits. And, and uh, so, you know, I was sort of on this mission then to figure out this, this very complex individual, <clears throat> right? Like how the hell do you do that? And you know, after a year or so, we began to d to date, and I began to go to more races regularly, and and I would watch this woman who ran because she loved running, not because she wanted to win stuff. Um, win races, and and I would see this strategy of just doing your best, uh, continue to qualify her for world championships and Olympic games, and give her a top 10 ranking in the world amongst some of the dirtiest athletes in the world. Yeah. And, um, and so I thought, wow, you know, there's gotta be something to this, right? It isn't, she's not like that just because she's sort of warm and soft and fuzzy. It's, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, maybe this is a competitive strategy. Maybe there's something to hugging your at your competitors before a race. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which used to drive me crazy. Like, <laughs> you know, I'd say, why do you hug Did your it? competitors? You know, you should be steely eyed. Don't, don't look at them. Don't even talk to them. Right. Yeah. Cause that's what I had been taught, but not Robin. She had this belief that synergy was a more powerful source of energy. Right. Yeah. He raced with her competitors, not against them. Wow. And she used to use, um, Canadian geese as as a, as a metaphor, right? Canadian geese can fly further and faster because they work together. Yeah. And I used to just shake my head and say, you know, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Of. And um, but you know, she certainly wasn't going to change her ways because I said so. And um, you know, and she continued on, and and I just it was such an inspiring. Yeah, she became such an influence on me, right? I mean, not just as a coach, not just when I came back to coaching, but as a, as a person as well. Um, so anyway, That's an, it's an incredible story. I I'm wondering how her influence on you transferred into you as a coach and how yeah. you sort of begun to integrate that. What sort of processes you went through? Yeah, all of it, you know, Martin, quite honestly, I, I took everything from Robin. So 
<clears throat> you know, but as I allude to in the book, uh, you know, part of the final <clears throat> straw in that was was uh, when Brian Donnelly got up in front of the front of the chapel at Shawnigan and, and shared his Olympic experience in Sydney. And, and I had coached Brian 10 years earlier at Shawnigan. Yeah. And, um, you know, and Brian and I are good friends and, you know, we're still in touch all the time. And, but I was so thrilled with him being at the Olympics and my views had changed on rowing in, in those 10 years, right? Cause I met, met Robin and there had been a transformation of, this isn't a war anymore, right? It's, this is a, it's a race. It's not a war and you don't go out there and try and kill people. It's, yeah. and, um, and so Brian, I, I invited him to come up to the school and speak to the kids and, and talk about his Olympic experience in Sydney where, where he'd finished seventh. They'd won the petite final in, in the men's eight. And he got up there and, and uh, you know, it was all going well until he started to talk about the competition where he, you know, he called it a war and he didn't go over there to lose. And, and uh, in fact, he said it was a goddamn war in the chapel. <laughs> And I just remember thinking, holy crap, you know, all of the verbiage that he was using is what I used to say to him. Yeah. And, and I had this moment of thinking, wow, that's my, he, here's my legacy right in front of me. Like I did that. And, and so that was it. That was, that was the end of it. I stopped using the word win. I stopped using war metaphors. Um, everything became about getting faster <clears throat> everything became about showing up on the day and having your best race. There was no, there was nothing about killing competitors or hating competitors. In fact, we used, I used to phone up the coaches at Brentwood and, uh, and say, Hey, let's, let's train together and uh, let's break down these old, these old paradigms. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, I say it now, I didn't say it then, but I was trying to build a culture of love, right. Where these boys, loved rowing they loved one another and they felt safe right if i were to say to use you know how i held safety as an athlete i never felt safe right i always felt threatened uh, yeah to lose my seat and then to lose so there was no safe container to perform i always felt um a threat under threat yeah and, and that's motivating, right? It is. Fear is motivating. But it elicits uh, cortisol and, uh, and adrenaline in our system, right? And, and those two, when those two chemicals are released into our body, they suppress performance, right? And um, so, you know, after Brian, it was, screw it. I'm going to do this completely differently. I'm going to embrace Robin's approach. Um, for no other reason that I, than I didn't want to ever have that sort of impact on a young boy. Yeah. And, uh, and lo and behold, it started, I mean, it just worked, right? Winning national championship year after year, setting course records, and uh, all the while not trying to win, right? Everything became about using rowing as a vehicle to... Uh, create life-changing experiences for young men and uh, and 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 showing boys young boys that when you when you backed into the gates at the start of a race and it meant as much to you to row for the guy in front and behind you as it did to row for yourself when, when there was that much love yeah that, that was a powerful place and when we got to that place, that's when the cool stuff would start to happen. And, wow. you know, <clears throat> especially in my second time at Shawnee or at Ridley, when I went back there in 2010, you know, I, and I said that to the boys at the opening meeting, I said, I understand why you've all come here. You know, you, you want to win a national championship. You want to get a scholarship to the U S you want to get your name on the most expensive trophy in Canada. I get all that. I get it. But, that's not why I'm here. I'm, I'm here because I want this sport to change your life. And, um, 
And I want you to learn that it's okay to love another boy. Like, I want that to be not creepy for you. And, um, and they were, <laughs> you know, yeah. there were some raised eyebrows and these were big, these were big lads. Right. But they, I just continued that messenger, Right. And, um, build the love. And, uh, you know, two years later, that crew set a course record, won the national championships. They got their school, they got their scholarships. They got all the things, all those tangible things, but, um, it was because of the love and the safety in, in that crew. Yeah. I, I'm just sold on that. I just know it. Yeah. And how, how do you work with athletes to achieve that in terms of, I, I know you, you, you t- in terms of talking from the front and being very right. open and this is my philosophy. So you're, 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 you're putting that across to them where you can, how do you work with them individually or, or in groups? Right. I, I, you know, and that's a great question. I think because <clears throat> with some of those boys, a lot of it became about breaking down old paradigms and having to introduce and build up a new one. Right. Cause a lot of them arrived with, that combative paradigm where my job is to go out and knock the crap out of anyone who lines up beside me. And, and so I get that. I mean, that was me. So I I understand that. Um, So it was really just about challenging those old paradigms and, and having those one-on-one conversations as well as group conversations and having them have moments of self discovery where where they realized that maybe there was something to this, that when they didn't focus on a certain number on an erg score, when they just went out there and focused on one stroke at a time and the process, if you will, Mm. that that sort of engagement would elicit scores they hadn't seen before. And so when you start, when they started to produce results, they had never produced before that intrigued them. Right. And then and then it just brought them along. And by the end, they were just it just became who we were as a crew. And uh, especially in the 2014 crew, which who I write about in pulling together. Yeah. You know, that was a boat that um, that understood it on a level that was was really impressive. So It's interesting when you look at particular crews, what was so special about that crew or that set that crew apart? <laughs> well, the- yeah, not just, you know, it wasn't just their performance record. I mean, they won every regatta they went in in North America. And um, and then certainly came over to Henley as the favored crew from North America. Um, you know, and, and spoiler, um, you know, we had that bike accident in Dusseldorf, right, where we're at our training camp. And, uh, you know, and so that really challenges... Um, it really put uh, my perspective uh, sort of under under pressure, right? It was, okay, how do we rely on, uh, like, where do we go now, right? We've, we now have a boy who can't, who can't row. And, and we're now going to bring a 16 year old spare. Uh, You know, I always say, when a spare gets the, gets the tap on the shoulder, it, it's a dream and it's a nightmare. Yeah, because it's what you want to happen, but what you're completely, what you're so afraid of happening. Because now, if the performance doesn't go well, well, you know, all fingers point to you. Yeah, and um, you know, and and so, you know, we had this expression in the face of adversity the question we would use is how can this be the best thing that ever happened to us? Wow. And so the morning after the bike accident, when we met as a crew, um, that was the question. And, and because those boys were used to that question, yeah, they were able to go away and really come back for a second meeting and go, well, this is what we're going to focus on. And I, I think what it did was, was really hone in, uh what had beaten the goal from two years prior which was to show up at Inc- at Henley and have the best race we can on the day yeah and and because now winning the event was likely off the table it allowed them the freedom to just go there and actually do that right and um 
and I mean, they raced beautifully and, and, uh, you know, I think we got what well, we got knocked, knocked out on Saturday, I think. So when I got back to the tent to meet with them and, and, um, I just said, you know, we've, uh, um, you know, we did everything we came here to do. Right. I asked them how the race went. How was the yeah, start? Yeah, how was the yeah. warm up? Everything went great. Could you have gone any faster? No. Then that's it. Mission accomplished. Right. We came here to find our best race on the day and we did that. Yeah. And so there was no regret. Right. And whereas in Seoul, um, holy crap, like mission not accomplished. Right. We did. We didn't go there and and do what we were supposed to do, which was defend the Olympic champion. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, back to that original question of the messaging, I just think, you know, for me as a coach, it became imperative that, um, that I become the message, right? It wasn't just about what I said and what I had them do, but I had to walk that. And, and I, I think this is par- probably – the most challenging part of, of coaching. Um, and that is the unconditional love that we invite coaches to show their athletes. Yeah. So whereas you show up to your athlete before, during and after an event as the exact same coach. Yeah. So the athlete knows that regardless of what happens, when, when they come back into the dock, they're going to meet the same coach. Yeah. Yeah. And so what that does is it takes the coach out of the motivation equation, right? The athlete is not worried about your response when they're out there racing. When I was racing, I yeah. was worried about Neil's response. Yeah. Right. And, and so it motivated me, but it was also a huge distraction, right? That fear got in the way of me racing to my potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So by creating an incredibly safe container for those boys, a container where they felt they would be loved unconditionally, it's the expression we use, you know, um, the, the more you feel safe to fail, the less often you fail. You fail. So by creating a container where athletes feel safe, they go out and perform at levels that, that they may not have thought were possible. And, and, and so when love is unconditional in that yeah. container, uh, I just think coaches, you, you see things, you see levels of performance you may not have otherwise. How, how far has, you know, your, your personal message been able to spread through the Canadian rowing community or in the performance community, in yeah. the sports community? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, hmm. I remember in 2006 or seven. I remember phoning up, uh, now I'm going to forget his name, uh, big fellow. Um, anyway, he was head of Rowing Canada. He was in LA, he rode in the quad. Um, oh, goodness. Anyway, it'll come to me. Um, uh, Oh shoot! <laughs> anyway, so I called him up and I said, "Look, I want to speak at the at the next rowing conference, right? Yeah. I, want to, I, I want to tell my story." So this was after Shawnigan, my first my first go when I I um, retired I had retired from coaching, left the school after having some you know some pretty good success with yeah. the program. And uh, Phil Moncton and Phil, uh, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so. Yeah. Um, and so Phil says, well, what do you want to talk about? And, and I said, I'm not sure yet. I just, know, <laughs> I just know I want to get up there and speak and share what I've figured out, kind of. And uh, he said, well, how about we start you with the BC conference, British Columbia, with my own province? Yeah. So I did that. And then I spoke at the, at the national one. And, you know, and <sighs> yeah, there were a lot of raised eyebrows and, there was a lot of, it was, it was soft, right? It was a soft approach. The idea of utilizing love as a motivator, as a, as a, as a form of motivation was, it just wasn't, people weren't ready for that. Some people weren't ready for that. Some people. Yeah. So fast forward to last year, uh, Kath Bishop, 
with uh, the love speaks, at the, speaks at the national conference online, but she still speaks. Mm. And she shares her message and I'm on the panel. And, and so, and I, and her message is, you know, the long win, yeah. right? It's about process. It's about creating culture of safety. And it just felt so awesome to see that, you know, all these years later, we were not only embracing it, but that was the keynote of Rowing Canada's national conference, a message that was about, about uh, creating a holistic, healthy coaching context for our athletes. Yeah. And Michelle Darville, you know, I mean, look what she did with the women, utilizing an incredibly holistic approach to coaching where we, we call it an athlete centric approach. Yeah. Where you look where every decision that's made <clears throat> is, is, is seen through the eyes of the athlete. And part of the pushback we get on that is that, well, then you create these entitled little spoiled brats and yada, yada, yada. And, and that's not true at all. That's a story. Yeah. What it does is, is it means that the decisions that you make are in the best interest of the athletes. It doesn't mean re you relinquish control. It means you invite them to, to the table as, as problem solvers. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. They become part of the process. And what that does is it empowers athletes, truly, right? Because they start coming to practice on their terms, because they want to be there. One of the things I always used to say was, you know, a, a, good, a good culture on a rowing crew is where any athlete can quit at any time of the year and, and feel safe to quit. Because, you know, the last thing you want is an athlete coming to practice because they feel obliged. Yeah. Because they don't want to catch the wrath of their coach or their teammates, right? You want them coming there on their terms. You want them coming there because they love rowing and because they love the members of the crew. They love being at practice. So when you use a stick and carrot approach to coaching, you create a culture where, you know, <laughs> probably the majority of your athletes don't love rowing. They love perhaps the end game. They love what they get out of it maybe. And that's an egoic experience, but, but what I wanted was a body experience. I wanted athletes to be at practice and feel like that was the best two, three hours of the day. And that when they left practice, all they could think about was the next morning when they got to do it again, because yeah. they loved who they were when they were at practice. When you create that, you know, you, you create fast crews, but um, more importantly, you create healthy human beings, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. In a, in a holistic way. I mean, I'm I'm thinking one has to be quite a special kind of person, or have gone through an experience, or have experienced that kind of coaching technique yourself, because that's that's not the norm. No. So I'm thinking, what would make a person who's a coach or people listening to this, what would make them or how would they go about integrating those ideas into their own coaching? Right. Um, yeah. It's not a light switch, Martin, right? It's not like you wake up one morning and you go, oh, okay, well, I'm going to become this holistic coach. You, <laughs> you, you have to arrive at that place. And, and I think that's why it was effective for me because it was a genuine uh, journey for me, right? I went from this highly combative, uh, toxic driven individual who mm. only valued winning. And then, and then I journeyed through that to this, to this other person, right? This person who, because of Robin um, and because of what I went through in my transition mm. came to a place that, that realized, you know, there's gotta be more to this than just winning stuff. Right. I mean, that's there's got to be more to this. And so I, I think, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know that it's a textbook experience. I think um, uh, having said that, we do invite coaches, obviously, to try it on. Right. To have a look at, you know, legacy is a big part of our work. Right. When you think about your legacy. Right. When you think about how 
your athletes and your parents are going to remember you? How, what are the words they're going to use to, use to describe you? Mm. You know, that's a powerful moment. Right. And, and so for me, that was the change. Right? When I, when I, when I realized that the way Brian spoke that day in chapel was a reflection of my legacy. Mm. Um, that was it. That was a gut punch. And, um, and then I just started figuring it out uh, by utilizing holistic approaches, right? Making it about process, making it about safety, making mm. it about love. And, and when we say love, we don't mean, obviously don't mean in a romantic sense in, you know, it's about deep connection. It's about yeah. deep relationships. Right. And, and so what I, what I put paramount in my coaching was the relationship that I had with the boys. That was more important than anything else that I did. Mm. You know, when I, I remember the first, when I used to go to regattas and I'd be walking my crew down to the water and I'd look around at the other coaches and I'd think, well, hell, you, you know, I don't, I don't know any more about coaching than they do. I don't, I don't know any more about rigging or training yeah. or our boats are the same. Our race strategies are probably the same. We probably have done the similar workouts getting here. So I just thought, well, how am I going to be a different coach? Like what, what are the boxes that I can tick that I think they're yeah. not going to tick? And that box became the emotional resilience of the athletes that I worked with. And what became paramount was my relationship with them. And so, but at no point did that mean that my coaching became soft. I mean, you know, just phone up the, the guy yeah. in the 2014 crew and ask them if our training regimen was soft. I think they'd all say, no, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but it was done in an environment that was about love, about connection. It was about me valuing those young individuals as people first, right? They weren't there to, to, to be, uh, to create a fast crew so that I would look good as a coach. Mm. They were there because I had been entrusted with the power of influence over these young boys. And, and I think when coaches have a realization that it is a privilege to work with young yeah. boys and girls, that's a privilege because you have the power of influence. And I think when you have that moment, your coaching changes. Yeah. It no longer becomes about you. It becomes about them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and when it becomes about them, you, you start to, you know, you start to listen to how you talk. You start to listen. You start to be aware of how you are in front of your athletes, in front of other coaches, in front of the parents, because they're watching. And, um, and so, you know, all that to say, it, it doesn't mean that you, it doesn't mean that you become any less ambitious, right? I mean, mm. when I look back at my, my record, as a coach, it's an impressive record. There were mm. a lot of wins, but that was never the point of it in my yeah. second iteration as a coach, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Winning came as a result of me focusing on relationships and building trust and creating safety. Like, mm. I just can't say that enough. That was, yeah. that was the ticket. I'm, I'm very struck by your use of the word love. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking, oh, what are the implications for me? Because I, as a coach, I think I've become more, um, I've become less angry and more, more mellow and more right. fun with kids. Right. Um, definitely. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's quite a challenge. It's an, it's an interesting word to use, isn't it? To get for, a, as you say, for, a, for a coach to get their head round. Right. Um, yeah, I get that. And we hear it all the time. Like we hear it all the time. In fact, I love when coaches come up during a workshop or, or after a keynote and they'll say, uh, you know, and they're usually an older coach and they'll say, well, you know, we use the word respect, right? <laughs> um, that's the same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I say, no, it's not the same thing. It's respect. And then I playfully say, it's why during a, a wedding ceremony, they say love and respect because love and respect are different. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. don't say respect and respect, <laughs> right? They say love and respect. Yeah. So we're inviting you to love your athletes. Yeah. But not in a, 
you know, not in that in the way that we've bastardized the term, right? And um, and I think when people realize that for me to love someone, it doesn't. It's it's about how I value them as a person. Yeah, it's the yeah. relationship and connection between us. Yeah, that's a different interpretation, and I think I think that gives people permission to try it on, right? And um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I've often said, look, look at if if all you want to do is win, then give it a try. Like whatever brings you to the party, yeah. I, I don't care. But then once you get a taste of it. I think that's that's the elixir, right? That that's what brings them in and says, "Okay, I'm staying. I'm in. Yeah. I'm sold." Yeah. Because even if I had been given permission, Martin, to to go back and use everything that I'd learned from Neil and Spracklin and whatever, right? Even if I had, if I if it was okay to use those tools, I wouldn't, because I know they're not effective. They're not no, no, as yeah. effective. That's effective. As what yeah. I discovered through Robin, right? Yeah. Um, so if you had to describe your life mission now, I'm thinking it would be something around putting those, putting that, that concept, that way of being to, a, to a wider, a much wider audience, which right. is kind of what your work is now, I'm guessing. Yes. Yes. And, you know, when I, uh, for a long time, obviously struggled for what was the meaning and purpose of soul. Right. And, um, uh, and, and I can say now at, and I've been able to say it for a number of years, but I can easily say now that, that getting my teeth kicked in on the world stage has, has brought me to a place now where I understand my purpose, right? My mission. Yeah. And, and that is to help, uh, you know, to support individuals in the pursuit of, of, of high performance, whether it's business or sport or, or education or, or what have you, right? The, the performing arts, it doesn't matter. Performance is performance, right? It's a, it's a human expression. And so we just invite people to try, to try on a different way and, yeah. uh, and to challenge old paradigms around performance. Yeah. Ones that, you know, when people say sports in trouble, right? We, we need to revamp sport. Sport's not in trouble. We're in trouble, right? Sport is a reflection of who we are as people, of, of what yeah. we value. And because for so long we have valued, you know, sort of the masculine traits of dominance and, and, um, and power and strength and, and that combative force, that's what sport has become. But when we, when we start to value the feminine in all of us, right? yeah. the notion of nurturing, the notion of, notion of, of kindness and synergy, and love, when we start to bring those to the table, sport will begin to reflect that because we value them yeah. as people. And that's when sport will, will reach a, another level of influence, right? Not just in its yeah. ability to perform, but in its ability to have an impact on, on society. So, Yeah, that, that's really striking, Jason. I, I, I just wonder, if you, have you ever been in... Um, now, sometimes I get kids that I've taught or they, they say things, you know, they, they're almost giving back to you their experience. So if you had sure. any of those experiences from kids that you've you've worked with and um, come back to you and give you stuff back. Um, in terms of feedback or how, how do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, of... I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm still in touch with, uh, I mean, even Brian, um, but <laughs> I'm in touch with a lot of those boys from the Shawnigan crew from the, from the, you know, the book in chariots and horses. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they say, they say very generous things. Right. And, um, and then same with the boys from Ridley. Yeah. It's uh, I, I just think, you know, another thing, when you coach on this level, when you're in it with them, it's a different it's a different gig, right? You are invested in, in their souls, right? It's a, yeah. it's a deeper experience. And so they feel that investment. And, and because they feel that, it's lifelong. It, it doesn't end the day of the finals. It's not like, well, okay, yeah. well, thanks for that. You know, we'll see you. <laughs> we'll see you later. Right. It just, how could you, how, how could you not be in touch or connected for the rest of your life? And, um, 
Yeah. I mean, I haven't coached in a number of years and, you know, people say, do you miss it? And, you know, I don't miss all the politics and all that crap, yeah, but, yeah, but I miss yeah. the boys, right? I miss the boys. I, I miss that connection of, of being around teenage boys who are, who are mischievous and insecure yeah, and, yeah. and they're inappropriate and they say stupid things and, you know, and you just, you know, they just want to, they're just trying to figure it out. Right. And um, like all of us, but um, you know, I think that was my favorite part of that. Well, not think that was my favorite part of coaching was, yeah. was being around that teenage energy of just of, uh, of innocence. You know, it's a beautiful time of life. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, uh, we, we've been talking for over an hour now, Jason. Um, oh, I, okay. Yeah. It's just, it's been an extraordinarily powerful chat to listen to and be and be part of. Um, I, I'm quite conscious we were we were talking before we, we ought to talk about your novel that's coming out. Yeah. In uh, June, I believe. Yes. yes. Is is it called Ike? It's called Ike. Yeah. yeah. So it's about um, you know after I retired from rowing, as as I alluded to, there was some bit of a uh, you know bit lost in that and um and so i thought it would be a good idea to volunteer as a as a puppy walker right to get a guide dog puppy a golden retriever as a bit of a distraction and you know sort of another purpose right and of course i went into that relationship thinking that i was going to create the world's best guide dog and uh, so initially it was a bit of a competition for me and um but you know, that only lasted, I would say, six months or so where eventually, you know, being with this puppy 24 hours a day and it, uh, you know, I became invested in that in that dog. And so what happened was that about eight, nine months into it, he he was failed out of the program for health reasons. And so I was offered this opportunity to keep the dog. And, um, and originally it was like, well, you know, I can't do this. I'm in school. I, yeah. you know, I was living as a student. You can't have dogs in Vancouver you can find a place to live. And, and, uh, you know, my, the roommates I had at the time said, you'd be crazy to not keep that pup. And, um, yeah. and so I did, and he ended up living nine years and, and in those nine years, you know, Robin and I referred to him as our firstborn and, wow. uh, he was our, he was our ring boy and um, he just became, uh, you know, and I, and I don't think this word is too big. He became a mentor for me. There, there's just yeah. no doubt. Right. He um, in so many ways, he became my, my guide dog. And um, because, because I was blind and, and lost and, uh, and it took this very uh, wise soul um Ike to, you know, to, to show this very bitter and angry young man, um, you know, the meaning of love and, yeah. uh, and I'm forever grateful for him. Right. He's just, wow. a, he was a remarkable boy and he, and he had an incredible life. I mean, he went on to, I started a food business in Vancouver and he was the, he was the face of that business it's still running now 20 plus years, you know, and, yeah, he was just an amazing dog. He would come out in the coach boat with me when I coached at Shawnigan and um, uh, he, he ran with me when I trained for ultra marathons up in the mountains and he, he was just an incredible dog. And so I wanted to share the story of this dog. And, um, and so I, the story is told through his eyes, right? It's written in the dog's voice. Yeah. And uh similar to racing in the rain, perhaps people might be familiar with that book. And um, yeah, uh, it's, you know, we've sent it out to some early readers and the feedback's been very positive and, you know, I'm excited to see how it's going to land. So, uh, wow. yeah. So early June or June. Yeah. And if people want to get in touch with you, um, how do they do that, Jason? Um, well, your mindset.ca is our, all one, your mindset.ca is, is our website and uh or jason at your mindset um is my uh uh 
is my email and yeah, happy to chat. And, you know, and sometimes there's often a lot of questions around, around these kinds of conversations, Martin, yeah. because, because it is new as, as you alluded to, right. It's not, it's not the norm. And, um, and that's okay. That's okay. You yeah. Know, one, one little step at a time. So. Jason, I can't believe what an inspirational uh, chat this has been. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, we'll end the live part of our, of our chat now, but okay. just, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure, you know, and I've, I've been a, a fan from afar for so long and now to, to have a chance to converse has been wonderful. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Jason.